on this edition of In the Life, a sense of urgency. It was democracy in action. And I'm going to tell you it's your duty to speak up. Creating a character. It's my constant effort to make them bigger, to be more fun boy, to queer them up a little bit. A leap of faith. I sort of figured, well, you know, if somebody comes right out and says, are you a lesbian, I'm going to say yes. All this and more on America's Gay and Lesbian News Magazine. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation and by the Arcus Foundation and by the Gill Foundation and by the annual support of In the Life members like you. Welcome to In the Life. I'm Anthony Rapp, and I'm excited to introduce you to some extraordinary people on tonight's program. Our first segment takes us back to the early 1980s, a time when lesbians and gay men appeared to be worlds apart. Their politics were different. They socialized separately. But then AIDS hit. The urgency of this crisis spurred many lesbians to join forces with their gay brothers to fight this disease. In 1987, the organization ACT UP was born out of anger at the government's passive response to AIDS. ACT UP quickly gained a reputation for its in-your-face, aggressive tactics. Started by a small group of gay men, ACT UP soon became a home for lesbians who quickly understood that AIDS would spread beyond the gay community. Together, the men and women of ACT UP collaborated and forever changed our understanding of AIDS and the nature of what queer politics could be. Tonight, we feature the stories of some of the remarkable women who embraced the AIDS crisis as their own. It was a remarkable time. We were coming off of the sexual liberation of the 70s and gay lib and feminism. I had been demonstrating against the Vietnam War in the late 60s and in the feminist movement in the 70s. I was starting to see friends get sick. Gay men were just dying in alarmingly growing numbers. People were sick and dying, and dying in shame. No one knew how you got HIV. There was a new disease that had absolutely no cure and an almost immediate death sentence. We're dealing with an epidemic. We're dealing with a war. And people were dying in this war. And the government had turned its back. There was rage, like, no one's doing enough, no one's talking about it, it's not on the news. It is time to wake up. You've got to wake up and you've got to make some changes. People are dying and it's going to get worse. I became incensed and just livid about all this. Someone told me about ACT UP and that this was a group that was going out in the streets and demonstrating. A friend of mine said, hey, I heard about this group that's meeting at the community center and they're doing stuff around AIDS and um, let's go. And I walk into this room, and it's got 400 men and, like, four visible women, two of whom are straight. And I went, like, OK, what is this about? Less than 12 hours from now, we are going to be taking over City Hall. I was impressed by the 
energy, by the dedication, by the intensity, by the ideas. One idea a minute. It seemed like chaos initially at those meetings. Very voluble, very dramatic, people screaming out stuff. Everybody could say what they wanted. No one was in charge. There was no leadership hierarchy. And that was kind of the beauty of it. It was a very, it was democracy in action. Let us celebrate together tonight the end of the last day on which Ed Koch can tell himself that the communities which are being decimated by this epidemic are so weak and so divided among themselves that he can keep serving us this kind of <laughs> Tomorrow morning, we will begin to learn the truth. Backed Up was made up of many people, of big wild queens and, and, and uh, you know, mothers of three and uh, old and young, a lot of people who had cut their teeth on the uh, civil rights movement of the 60s and the anti-war movement of the late 60s and early 70s joined ACT UP. Many of us found ourselves in the ACT UP meetings, kind of looking around the room for other women. And uh, this group that found each other uh, really derived support. We have to end this with Ann Northrup giving her soundbite yeah. technique. Yeah. There definitely were other women, because that's what I was fascinated by. I saw Ann Northrup. Yeah, of course, there are unrealistic expectations that I won't be able to fulfill. Of, you know, <laughs> having this chance. Didn't know her and thought she was really dynamic and amazing. And, you know, she snapped her finger and those boys listened. <laughs> While Mike asks you politely to step forward, I'm going to ask you more strongly than that. And I'm going to tell you it's your duty to speak up. You must represent yourselves, and you must speak directly to the public. We cannot be intermediaries and have an effect. You have to speak directly. So please. The beauty of ACT UP was that it was one of the few places where a room full of men would actually listen to women and ask us for guidance and education and help. Every time a new lesbian would come in, we would, we would say, hi. <laughs> We'd sort of bring her over, OK. And then one night, we decided that we would just have dinner together to talk about why we were in ACT UP. Why were a bunch of lesbians in ACT UP doing work around AIDS? I know what brought me there was homophobia, the fear of it, the real exhibition of how blatant homophobia was because of the way it was operating. Um, for the gay men I saw who were sick. For me, it really was about my understanding of the larger issues, that this was, in fact, exactly like the U.S. government waging the Vietnam War or the issues in the feminist movement. It was about the government letting people die. Although each woman had her own motivation to join ACT UP, as a group, they shared a common goal, to let the world know that women get AIDS, too. Nobody was talking about women with HIV. No one. No one. And even though the first cases of women with HIV were found at exactly the same year as the cases for men. And that burned us up. I mean, you know, the fact is that women were being overlooked in this epidemic. One day after an ACT UP meeting, we were sitting in a diner, we being this group of women who had found each other on the floor of ACT UP. And as we were sitting there talking, someone came in with the current edition of Cosmo and said, oh my god, you know, they dropped it on the table and they said, I can't believe this. The article was basically saying straight women with male partners who have unprotected sex don't need to worry about ever getting AIDS. Even if you had sex with someone who was positive, it went so far as to say. The women of ACT UP immediately scheduled a meeting with Dr. Robert Gould, 
a psychiatrist and the author of the Cosmopolitan article. An ACT UP member videotaped this session. Why did you choose Cosmopolitan as the place to do this when you knew there would not be the possibility of substantiating some of your claims with the kind of footnoting and bibliography that is crucial to any kind of serious work on this it issue? purely fortuitous. Myra Appleton, who is the article's editor, is a good friend of mine. She knows my thinking when we talked about things at dinner, one thing or another, and she said, you know, I think this would be a good piece for our readers. And I thought about Cosmo and... We would always give those people in power a chance to say, okay, we're just going to change it. You know, instead of like immediately having a demonstration, we would say, well, maybe you can talk to them. Let's see. Well, can I just quote from your article? You say, can a recurrent sexual activity with a person who does carry the AIDS virus cause you to develop AIDS? Not if you subscribe to the theory supported by considerable fact, which I have just put forward, that you don't get AIDS from sexual activity with a man who has the disease or carries the virus unless you engage in anal sex or there is an open lesion in the vagina when you are having vaginal intercourse. That's wrong. It's a different point of view. I really am convinced from all the people I've talked to and all the work that I have gone over that I am not on the wrong track. I do happen to think that the statement about... The women of ACT UP demanded a formal retraction by Dr. Gould and Cosmopolitan magazine. Their demand was denied. And right then and there we started putting together an action to protest Cosmopolitan magazine for running this article. It was the very first action the women organized. So we picketed, picketed, picketed in front of the Cosmo building. We kept trying to get in. We want action. Prince of retraction. We want action. Prince of retraction. We went to move the barricade out, and one of the cops said, you can't do that. And we said, oh, no, the demonstration is over. And we said, oh. And he opened it up. And then we went, don't go to bed with Cosmo. And we just started chanting again. Boycott Cosmo! Boycott Cosmo! Boycott Cosmo! Boycott Cosmo! The women of ACT UP were the conscience of our organization. They were more mature than the guys. They were more focused. Say no to and the women woke us up. Cosmo, say no to Cosmo, say no to Cosmo. They opened our purview and, and really helped us understand more about what was happening in the epidemic. In 1991, three years after the Cosmo demonstration, ACT UP successfully pushed the Centers for Disease Control to redefine AIDS to include women. This crucial change enabled women with AIDS to receive a range of benefits for the first time. ACT UP also convinced pharmaceutical companies to lower the exorbitant prices of vital drugs, making them accessible to more people. Through passion and persistence, ACT UP radically changed the public perception of AIDS. It was no longer just a gay disease. It was now everyone's disease. People always say, oh, you can't do anything. The government is so big, it's so complicated. There's no way you can get them to do anything. And we did. And I think that was one of the things about ACT UP. People had a vision. People, we actually believe we could change things. By the women organizing, we opened up the agenda. And we showed that it, it could be done, and that we weren't going to end up off on a tangent that ultimately we would always end back at the AIDS crisis. One of my friends uh, came from a rather, you know, wealthy Westchester uh, world, and uh, he recalled visiting home, and his mother was sitting with her, you know, well-to-do lady friends playing bridge, and then as the women are playing cards, one turned to the other and said, those gay people, I didn't realize they got so angry. And maybe that is one of the main lessons we taught, that uh, gay people were not going to lie down and die. 
that gay people could be angry and could fight back. I was growing up in Mississippi and I had never met anyone in my life who was gay, who was under the age of maybe 50, especially someone who wasn't just alone. So I never really thought of that like being a possibility for me to actually come out and then have relationships and anything like that. And so I was kind of, I was 15, I was really angsty about it. I was not happy. And one day my mother kind of pulled me aside and said, I think there's something wrong with you and I think you're not telling me what it is, but I think you want to tell me. And I was just sitting in the kitchen with my sister and my mom was like doing the dishes or something like that and I just, I said, out of nowhere, it just, it just came out and I just said, you know I like girls, right, mom? And she turned around and she said, what? <laughs> she said, what? And, and she had this smile that she gets on her face, which is just so loving. And, and I knew at that moment that it would be okay. I just never wanted to say the words, I'm gay. I figured that would be really hard. So I wanted her to say it for me and for me to agree. And so she wouldn't do that. She just said, no, I, don't, I want you to tell me. And I said, I don't think I can do that. And then I cried and then she cried and then I started crying more because I realized I was trying to say it and I couldn't say it. And then finally I said, I think you know, I think you know that I am gay. And she looked at me and she cried and she said, I'm so glad you're not pregnant. <laughs> the world of comic books is filled with gay metaphors. Flamboyantly dressed superheroes with secret identities and mutant X-Men rejected by society. Perhaps that's why so many gay artists are drawn to the medium. You're about to meet Phil Jimenez, a successful and openly gay comic book creator who invited us behind the scenes to catch a glimpse of his imagination at work. Some people think of comics as the trashiest of art forms or not even an art form. To me, they're modern myths, and I think they have all the same power as ancient myths to inspire hope and heroism. And it's incredible to be a part of that. Over the years, I've drawn just about every major character in comics, Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, the X-Men, but my favorite will always be Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman is princess of the Amazons, raised on this island of women called Paradise Island, a lesbian haven, many would think. And she left her island home to come teach man a better way to live, um, peace, harmony, hope, love, equality between the sexes. What I love about Wonder Woman is that she's given me a set of rules to live by, a set of rules I've tried to live by my entire life. I love her, and I wouldn't have the life I do today without her. Oh my gosh. Is this actually where I used to live? Ah, they're pink. I was raised in small and pink apartments. No wonder I'm gay. I used to live right down there. I was a latchkey kid. My father left us when I was six months old. And my mother, God bless her, had to work. So I was alone a lot. What that meant was I drew all the time, created my own little worlds, played with my toy dinosaurs, and I watched a lot of TV. And it was on TV that I discovered Wonder Woman. All the world is waiting. You wanted to reach out and touch her. She was amazing. I mean, she's she was like six foot in her stocking heels. She walked around in that costume like she owned it, and she was just stunning. 
Around the same time, I think this was actually 1976, my mother bought me my first comic. It was a Wonder Woman comic. And from then on, I was hooked. Wonder Woman was a sexual figure with extreme power. Here was a woman who was incredibly beautiful and incredibly desirable as a sex object. She ran around fighting crime in a bathing suit, for God's sakes. But she could throw a car over her head. She could kill a Medusa with her bare hands. And then she would go home to her CIA secret agent boyfriend, Steve Trevor. It was something that I think I could relate to, even though I'm not sure at six I could ever tell you why. This was his first drawing, or his first comic book, so to speak, on the back of, of, of printout paper that I brought home from work. And he was five years old at the time. She's telling Steve she's going to get dressed, D-R-E-S-T. And this is where she's twirling to become Wonder Woman. He used to do this by the hour. He would lay on the floor and uh, do nothing but draw. I was by myself a lot. Um, and I think one of the reasons I drew so much was to entertain myself. Uh, I do remember that I was not allowed to watch TV after a certain time. But I also knew that my mother wouldn't come home till a certain time. So very wisely, I would watch the TV and then turn the TV off half an hour before to let the machine cool down. Because when she would come home, she would put her hand on the TV to see if it was still warm. I felt very guilty, as I say, the guilt uh, to have it to, to leaving him by himself, but you know it was necessary. But at that time, uh, that's that's all I had. I had no choice. I was never wanting for food. I always had my own bedroom. Um, I always had clothes, and I always knew she loved me. It's beyond impressive to me to think of what my mother did for me growing up and what she sacrificed, because I know she had a failed marriage and bad boyfriends and. I know she suffered from low self-esteem, and yet somehow, some way, she worked really hard. <laughs> um, to make sure that it could live in those little pink apartments over there. Wow. See, these were all strawberry fields when I grew up. It's just mini mall after mini mall, and chain store after chain store. And whenever I see a movie like Star Wars or uh, Lord of the Rings, and I think of these amazing, beautiful worlds, and then I look around here and I think, why don't we have that? This is why I don't live in Southern California. I was completely fascinated by uh, extinct animals, dinosaurs, mammals, saber-tooths, mammoths, tyrannosaurs. It didn't matter. If it was big, if it was scary, I loved it. My grandparents and my mother would take me here to La Brea Tar Pits, and they would let me roam. And it was a place they would know I would go, and I would sit, and I would draw. I would run around the museum and look at these ancient extinct animals. Whenever I come back here, it feels like home. When I started drawing my own series, Otherworld, I came back here and I took tons of reference photos. I then used the photos to create several scenes in the book. And I knew that right there in the sky above is where I wanted my villains to come crashing through a door and attack the heroes right over there on this hill. By the time I got to high school, I knew I was different. I knew I was gay. It certainly wasn't something I was ready to tell anyone. Here we go, gentlemen. Cypress High School, home of the Centurions. As Obi-Wan Kenobi once said, you'll never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. You must be cautious. And because I could draw, I was friends with all the different cliques, and there were definitely cliques here. 
I drew unicorns for the girls and dragons for really cute boys. Who it turns out were not so cute at my high school reunion. I think they peaked at about 17. Looking back on the coming out process, and mine was certainly stifled, one of the things I realized I did was turn all of my high school crushes into comic characters. I think it was a way to work through those crushes and um, create gifts for people and give signs of my affection without actually touching them, doing it in a really safe way. So by the end of high school, I had made over 50 or 60 comics for a, a teacher, a friend of mine, and uh, two attorneys I'd worked with on a mock trial team. And I created these elaborate stories for them. And then looking back on it, I realized that in all those comics, their wives were always getting kidnapped, and the kids were usually off stage, and their shirts were getting ripped off, and somehow I always managed to be in those comics. If I didn't know exactly what I was doing, um, they would have to be idiots not to. But I commend them because they put up with it and they tolerated it. They could have easily brushed me off. They could have rejected me and just told me to go away. But instead, they encouraged me. They let me draw for them. In many ways, these three men gave me a really big gift and allowed me to be. And that's actually, I'm not sure any of them actually know that. Oh my God. This is student council. No, yes, he was on the student council. And this was I really wanted to be a cheerleader. <laughs> he was in drama, student council, mock trial, honor roll, who's who. He was in mock trial. And they oh, took wow. state finals. And they went to oh. Dallas for nationals. Well, I also, I forgot, I brought your driver's license. I think you're right. <laughs> I saved it. This was his driver's license. <laughs> Are you speechless, honey? <laughs> Best party ever. <laughs> Here's my question. Are your mothers this proud? <laughs> I brought out the old pictures oh, because, nice. yes. Oh, wow, I didn't realize what was in here. That was my first boyfriend. With his very hairy chest. Yes, with him. My vest. goodness. Yeah. Neil Posner was my first editor, and he was probably my greatest mentor at DC Comics. He was an incredibly talented man with some very strong opinions about the way things should be done. I developed a crush on him the minute I met him, and I wanted to know more about him, and I wanted to be with him all the time. So I'd hang out with him at work. Uh, in the offices far later than I had any reason to. I would buy clothes I couldn't afford to impress him. And eventually, I mustered the nerve to ask him on a date. And he was 15 years older than I was, and he had been my boss. And so, against his better judgment, he said yes. And it actually ended up being a really wonderful relationship. Unfortunately, he had AIDS. And at the time, I'm not sure I knew what that meant. I, I'm, knew that Rock Hudson had died of it, and I knew that a lot of gay men had it. But he was quite ill, doing pretty well. But this was far before, this was years before cocktails had emerged or um, more aggressive medicines. And I think he was very hesitant about dating, you know, someone so young, someone who's HIV negative, someone he had hired, for many reasons, aside from the fear of giving me HIV, I think he was afraid that if he told me, I would leave him. And the funny thing is, I think when you're that young and that romantic, it doesn't occur to you. You just, you're in love with this person and this is what you do. And so I stayed with him and I was um, his caretaker until he died. And the funny part about this, if such a thing can be said, is that nobody at DC knew that we were together. They just knew that we were really good friends. And so at his funeral, uh, a Jewish funeral at the Riverside Memorial on 75th Street, the rabbi was thanking all of these people who had taken care of him in the hospital. <laughs> and at the end, 
he, the rabbi said, and his partner, Phil Jimenez. And I could literally feel the rush of air as heads in the, in the audience from DC Comics turned to look back at me because no one knew. Before he died, Neil worked on a really famous version of Aquaman in the mid 80s. After Neil died, I was given the opportunity to take Aquaman's sidekick, Aqualad, and turn him into a more powerful hero called Tempest. I dedicated that miniseries to Neil, and on the back page, I came out publicly to the readers and to the people that supported the series, and I wrote openly about my relationship with Neil. He was the first man I ever asked out on a date. He was my first boyfriend. He was the first person I'd ever watched live with and die from complications from AIDS. Uh, it pretty much sucks that I can't tell him I love you face to face anymore, or hear him laugh, or teach him how to swim, or read old Legion of Superhero stories with him. His life and death moved a number of people. I'm not sure if he could fathom or believe how many. And every positive contribution I make to comics is inspired by and for him, wherever he is. The strangest part about dealing with loss, especially loss of someone who is sick or infirmed, and the bizarre feelings of sadness and guilt that you can actually go out and have a good time. How do you move on when you feel that you have unfinished business? <laughs> I'd like to introduce the world to Joe Hosking. Hello. My Hello. Superman. And I mean that literally. So you're super on flying. There we go. Now remember, look forward, and then, hold on, uh, keeping it up. Keep flying, keep flying. So Joe is not only my boyfriend, but he's also my model for Superman in DC Comics' Infinite Crisis. That's great. OK, just keep serious. Remember, think of it like the movie. Pretend it's the movie. OK, I'm going to get one more of you from right about here. And this is fantastic. I've been coming here since I was 16 years old, and every year I'm still amazed at the outrageousness, uh, the exuberance, the flamboyance of the people in their costumes, and the bond I feel with them. We're all here because we love comic books, we love superheroes, we love science fiction. We're all here because in many ways we're outsiders in our own lives, and here um, we're the ultimate insiders. In 2000, I was given the opportunity to write and draw Wonder Woman's adventures during her 60th anniversary. This was the chance of a lifetime. It literally was the thing I was the most excited to do in, in my life. Unfortunately, I had a lot of plans for the character that didn't really mesh with what the company wanted, so it turned out to be sort of a bittersweet experience. But I had to remember, I don't own this character. She is the property of Time Warner and DC Comics. I was just borrowing her. Um, nevertheless, it's my work on Wonder Woman that I'm best known for. Phil Jimenez? Yeah. Hi, how are you? Yeah, this is really good. Can you stand like this? Yeah, so here's my question. Like my, I respond to this character so deeply, and I always imagine the character being a little more joyous mm -hmm. than a lot of recent depictions of her. I don't want her to go to that dark place. How do you feel about that? I don't think she understands that part of the world. And I, I hope she never does. Me too. Oh my god, I'm so glad to hear you say that. She wants to be a teacher. She's not a yes! fashion. Yes! I'm so excited you said that. I have a comic in my bag that in case I ran into someone just like you, I could get your autograph. Okay, okay. okay. Yes. Great. You're good to me. A lot of people think, oh, you're famous, or people want your signature, they want your drawing, and I'm like, that's great, and I love it. But when you have your very own Wonder Woman action figure, a very own Superman action figure based on your drawings, that's the cool part. That's the stuff I live for. 
If you ever want to know like how being gay influences my work, just look at the hair, because I pick up stuff nobody else does. And actually working on figures like this, I had to explain to the sculptor, I was like, you're gonna have to be patient with me, but the hair is really, really important. And uh, when I designed it, they were like, well, her head's not gonna move. And I, I said, I don't care. Her head shouldn't move. It's not about that. It's about the hair. You look at some of these characters, and they're like big drag queens. I'll probably get in a lot of trouble for saying that, but you know, they wear tights, and they have capes, and they fly about. There's a wonderful flamboyance about them. And I actually embrace that. For so long, even now, the industry tries to minimize that to make superheroes more realistic. And I try to fight that every step of the way. And it's my constant effort to make them bigger, to be more flamboyant, to queer them up a little bit. Because I think the world is a little too mundane. I mean, that's why comic books were invented. By the time I was a senior in college, um, nearly all of my friends had come out, and they would sort of sit around and drum their fingers on the arms of the chair and say, well, Harry, well, well, well. <laughs> George W. Bush had just been elected. It was, his, it was his first address to the nation. And I figured, what better time? We're sitting there, we're watching it. And at a commercial break, I was like, Mom, um, I have to talk to you about something. And we kept bringing things up. And you know, eventually, the topic of gay things, gay people, were just part of it. Because you know, there was politics on television, and things like that will just eventually come up. And I asked her, I'm like, you know, what would you do if one of your children ended up being gay? Like, have you spoken to dad about this? Is this something you've actually considered? She's like, yeah, we brought it up, but you know, it's not, it hasn't happened. You know, we're not worried about it. And I'm like, well, start worrying, you know. Guess what, mom, I'm gay. I told my stepfather first. He used to come to the city um, um, all the time on uh, business. So he took me out to dinner. And I still remember sitting in a nice Chinese restaurant on the east side. And, um, uh, well, I had promised I would explain to him how I could drop out of graduate school and not get drafted, because this is, this is 1968. <laughs> um, so um, uh, I finally took a deep breath and said, I am homosexual, and closed my eyes. I remember doing this quite vividly. And I was rather surprised to open them, discovered that nothing had changed. <laughs> In 2003, veteran husband and wife filmmakers Susan and Alan Raymond spent over a year documenting the daily life of a Methodist church and its parishioners. Initially, they concentrated on the senior pastor who was brand new to the church. But midway through their project, an intriguing character suddenly emerged who grabbed their attention, associate pastor Beth Stroud. She was on the brink of telling her congregation that she was gay and in a committed relationship. The stakes were high. Beth Stroud fully understood that her coming out could cost her everything that she'd worked for. Tonight, we feature excerpts from the Raymond's compelling documentary, The Congregation. I was never really very sure how I would handle a direct question about my sexual orientation and the ordination process. And I sort of figured, well, you know, if somebody, you know, comes right out and says, are you a lesbian, I'm going to say yes. And that'll be the end of the process. But I'll, at least I'll, you know, pursued it that far. And um, I, I, never got in, I never got asked a direct question um, like that. And I have really wrestled with that as a moral decision and as an ethical decision. There may be people in, in this congregation who sort of, you know, who are, are still, you know, kind of struggling with homosexuality and Christianity and can they really be integrated and, uh, you know, and I, and... I admired her greatly. She was, a, she stood up for her rights. She said, there's an injustice here and I'm going to call you on it and I'm going to do it publicly. It was clear that associate pastor Beth Stroud had a natural ability to click with young people. 
Oh. In about five minutes, we're going to all circle up and... Oh. Yeah, well, we might have a prayer or something religious like that before we leave. <laughs> you got to do have... something religious. you got to do something. Right, it's, sure. a church, it's a church trip. One weekend, Beth Stroud took the teenagers on a retreat to discuss their faith. With your group, write down, come up with and write down four questions that you would like to ask the adults about their faith. Have you ever questioned your faith? If so, when, why, and for how long? Kind of during and after my first year of seminary, it sort of wasn't what I expected. Um, and I ended up dropping out for a year. And during the year I dropped out, um, I was involved in New York City in, a, in an AIDS activist group. Um, and during that year, I, was, I, was, um, I got to be friends with some people who died. Um, you know, I got to be friends with some people who had lost you know, nearly all of their friends that they'd been young adults with together. And during that time, I just, I, um, I just didn't understand how, if, if there was a God, how could, how could so much suffering happen? Or how could something so bad happen? When the young woman asks her the question, have you ever questioned your faith? I think that this was a question of daily issue at, her, at this time for her. It was in her daily prayers because she was thinking about uh, making the announcement that you know she was a lesbian. In terms of religious discussions, it's always to me more interesting to deal with someone who questions their faith than to someone who blindly accepts everything. Beth Stroud had come out to her family years before, but she called an informal meeting with them to learn how they felt about her decision to come out to the church. Hi. Hey. Hey. How are you doing? Hi, Mary. How are you? I'm good. Hi, Hi Ma. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Page, Beth's partner, also attended the meeting. It's a big family event, and we seem to come together for those. I mean, it'll be wonderful for you guys to be able to be, mm -hmm. to be out as a couple at church, and to be yeah. able yeah. to be, um, yeah, you know, for you to for you to be out at work, and it's a great thing. And it's been hard to picture precisely how it all happens in a really positive way, where everything gets to work out. And once you meet the family, it all it, it's it it all makes sense as to why Beth is who she is. She has these two parents. They're completely open and completely relaxed and, of course, concerned about her well-being, but completely um, supportive of her. And then you find out she has two sisters, and one of the sisters is gay. So this is a very interesting family. You know, when you were just going into the ordination process, mm -hmm. I remember we had a conversation way back then of me thinking, you know, well, why don't you just... Why can't you just keep it quiet, stay in the closet? And can't you do a lot that way? And you were saying at that point, no, you had to be open and out just because of what it would do to trust level mm -hmm. if people discovered that you hadn't been open. The mother wanted her to wait a little longer, you know, wait till you're a little older, or wait till the church laws change, you know. She's just being protective mother, but she was behind her daughter completely. I think the piece that probably scares me more, or leaves me a little more anxious, is, you know, what will happen down the road, and will you be able to continue to do what you really love to do? And that's the The night before she was to reveal her secret, 
Beth struggled to set the appropriate tone for her sermon. The hard part is kind of, you know, paring it down to a, a manageable sermon, um, trying to trying to write a sermon that's not, I mean, a sermon isn't supposed to be about me. It's supposed to be about God. The entire church was full. It was standing room only. Almost every single member of that church was there. I want to take my experience of the risen Christ out of the locked room, out of the closet, and into the world where everyone can see it. I want to walk in the light so that Christ might be revealed in my life. I know that by telling the truth about myself, I risk losing my credentials as an ordained United Methodist minister. And that would be a huge loss for me. But I have realized that not telling the whole truth about myself has been holding me back in my faith. I've come to a place where my discipleship, my walk with Christ, requires telling the whole truth and paying whatever price truthfulness requires. I don't feel afraid. As we enter into this time of risk and uncertainty together, there are a few things that I want to tell you. First of all, I want to tell you about a very important person that most of you haven't had a chance to know, and that person is my partner, Chris Page. Chris and I have lived together in a covenant relationship for two and a half years. More than anyone else in my life, Chris embodies grace and love and discipleship for me. She prays for me, and I pray for her. Chris is understandably nervous about becoming known as a minister's wife. <laughs> but I have promised her that she doesn't have to wear a big hat unless she wants to. <laughs> Despite all of the rules and locked doors and prohibitions, here I am for this Sunday at least, and perhaps for many months to come, your openly lesbian, fully credentialed United Methodist pastor. I'm excited to be able to give you the gift of my whole self in the fullest expression of my ministry for however much time we may have. God is alive. Look, here he is in our midst, even though the door was locked. Peace be with you. Amen. The real surprise is that she gets a standing ovation. The preconception would be she preaches a sermon like this and the audience doesn't really know how to react. And she gave a beautiful, moving sermon from her heart, which absolutely 
you know, a moved everyone. And I'm so glad to meet you. It is time to be an inspiration. We really are. Proud to know you. I wish you well. And we're behind you, Chris. Beautifully done. It was a great, joyous day. She wasn't just saying, this is my journey. She was saying, this is our journey. And the congregation was incredibly supportive of her. One year after the sermon, Beth Stroud's situation dramatically changed. Bishop Weaver of the United Methodist Church filed a formal complaint against Beth for being a self-avowed practicing homosexual. Bishop Weaver scheduled a private meeting with Beth before her trial began. On the one hand, it's, it's okay. This is what I bargained for. This is what I knew would happen when I was ordained. This is what I knew would happen when I preached my sermon. It's okay. Uh, you know, I'm at peace with it at some level. And, but on the other hand, it also comes so much out of this place of not being at peace right. with it. You know, it's, it's, it's not okay. It's not... I think that Bishop Weaver liked her. And, and Beth is a very um, uh, charming person and intense and, and honest. So I think you have to respond to that honestly, and I think he did. But he, as the head of the church, could not in any way accept her decision. We do not condone the practice of homosexuality, and that grieves me deeply when I think about uh, the pain that struggle has brought you. The path of the hearing and the trial, the path of the judicial process has, um, has looked to me like the best way to be faithful. Mm -hmm. um, it can be a way for people to really, um, you know, look each other in the eye across the table and say, you know, if this, is, if this is what we believe as a church, what does, what does this mean? And that ultimately may be the best we can hope for. Mm -hmm. This little light of mine, until let it shine, this little light of mine. Almost a year after meeting with Bishop Weaver, Beth Stroud went to court and faced a jury of 13 Methodist ministers who would determine her fate. Filmmakers Alan and Susan Raymond attended the trial, but cameras were not allowed in the courtroom. The, the moment of, of when the rubber hits the road was the trial. The trial was um, emotional and cold and businesslike. Everyone was against Beth. Everyone was just like, it, it really felt like a witch hunt. Um, I think this case has, has demonstrated how divided we are um, and, and what a challenging position that we're in as a church. And so I'm just um, feeling quiet, kind of somber, and, and in prayer for, for the jury and for the whole church. And she had to get on the witness stand and, and, and be asked very personal questions about her sex life. I didn't really understand what the purpose of that was until later someone explained to me that the nail in the coffin for Beth was that she was a practicing homosexual. You've requested the privilege of standing at the time of the reading of the penalty phase. The report of the trial court is that the credentials of the respondent are to be withdrawn and the vote was seven to six, meaning the required vote for the penalty. If you choose to appeal, we'll be glad to help if you so desire. And we are singing. On December 3rd, 2004, the jury of Methodist ministers found Associate Pastor Beth Stroud guilty of violating the church's ban on self-avowed practicing homosexuals in the clergy. Her credentials as a minister were officially revoked.
I'm Anthony Rapp. For all of us at In The Life, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next month. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation and by the Arcus Foundation and by the Gill Foundation and by the annual support of In the Life members like you.